Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to a new event of the Observatorio de la Lengua Española y las Culturas Hispánicas en los Estados Unidos, a research center of the Instituto Cervantes at Harvard University. I would like to greet both those of you who are familiar with our events, uh, among whom we have the Consul General of Mexico in, in Boston, Hello, Alberto Fierro, thank you very much for being with us once more. And those of you who are newcomers to our events. I know today we've got people from all the different, the very prestigious universities in this Boston area, as well as other universities in the US, in Britain, in Spain. Thank you very much to you all for being here today. I am very pleased and honored to introduce to you all Professor Paul Julian Smith, distinguished professor in the Latin American, Iberian and Latino cultures and the comparative literature program at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. He was previously distinguished professor of Spanish at the University of Cambridge for 19 years, and he also holds a PhD from that university. Now, those of you who are well acquainted with Professor Smith's career, will know that he is an internationally recognized critic in Hispanic cultural studies. He has been visiting professor in various universities, including Stanford, uh, New York University, Carlos III in Madrid, and has given over a hundred lectures and papers all over the world. Elected a fellow of the British Academy in 2008, his interests are wide ranging as his 22 books and over 100 academic articles may assess. One of his early books published in 1988, Writing in the Margins, was the first systematic application of post-structuralist critical theory to literature of the Spanish Golden Age. And a later book published in, in the year 2000 entitled The Moderns, Time, Space and Subjectivity in Contemporary Spanish Culture, was an equally groundbreaking examination, this time, of Spanish urban space. Professor Smith is the Spanish film critic for the Sight and Sound magazine of the British Film Institute. And another of his book, uh, books uh, entitled Desire Unlimited, the Cinema of Pedro Almodóvar, earned him a reputation as the major world scholar on the films of the Spanish director. But Professor Smith went beyond the field of cinema in a book entitled Contemporary Spanish Culture, TV, Fashion, Art and Film, published in 2003, in which he examined cultural areas that, that had received less academic attention, at least until then. He explored in that book, emotion, location, and nostalgia in each of those medias. Uh, Professor Smith's research also focuses on Mexico, as some of his most recent publications illustrate. I will just mention two from two, uh, 2017, like Spanish Lessons, Cinema and Television in Contemporary Spain, and Queer Mexico, Cinema and Television since the year 2000. In 2018, he published Spanish and Latin American uh, television drama, Joan Ram Format Translation. And more recently, in 2019, multi platform media in Mexico, growth and change since 10, 2010. I will just finish by saying that uh, Professor Smith has also been a juror in several international film festivals, like the Morelia Film Festival in Mexico and the San Sebastian International Film Festival in, in Spain. And he's the founding editor of the Journal of Spanish Cultural Studies. So because of all this expertise, in 2013, a tribute was organized in his honor at the Universidad Complutense de Madrid. So in my opinion, there could be no, nobody more knowledgeable, knowledgeable sorry, than him to speak to us about the, uh, the topic of today's event, Spanish series in the age of Netflix, an American perspective. But before I give Professor Smith the floor, 
Uh, could I ask you to please check that you've got your screens on the mute uh, mode? And I would also like to encourage you to ask your questions through the chat in writing. You can ask them, uh, and you can ask any question that Professor Smith's lecture may elicit, either in English and Spanish, and he will try to answer them all at the end of the lecture, at the end of the session in the Q&A uh, part of, the, of this session. Right, so I'm just, uh, Professor Smith has asked me to show you the following clip with which uh, he's going to start his lecture. So thank you very much, Paul. It's an honor to have you here and you have the floor now after we watch the, your, your, your clip. Wait a minute. Paquita Salas. Uh, no. Okay, who did you want me to call? Boss. Boss. Yo quedo con Paolo en casa a cenar. So thank you so much, uh, Marta, for the very kind invitation, also Victoria. Um, and um, so this lecture was commissioned for a book to be published by the Instituto Cervantes and Netflix. Um, and I have quite a specific brief, which is the reception of Spanish series in the USA, and to focus on series with women protagonists and the female audience. So I should say at the beginning that in general, my research goes in the opposite direction. I'm explaining Spanish or Mexican context of production and reception to an English speaking readership. So this was a novelty for me and I thank you for the chance to do this. Um, in general, also I'm against excessive attention to Netflix because accidents of accessibility, the idea that we can all see Netflix, which of course is not the case because in Mexico, say a half of the population doesn't have internet at home to watch streaming. Um, accidents of accessibility should not determine the scholarly field. It's very easy to sit at home and watch Netflix. It was much more difficult to go, say, to movie theaters when that was possible and watch what Spaniards or Mexicans were watching. Uh, um, so what I do in most of my work is to work, uh, focus on multi-platform ecology. So just another brief Mexican example, Alfonso Cuaron's Roma. So a feature film made by Netflix has monopolized critical attention. And the, its theme was domestic workers. But this theme of domestic workers had been treated earlier in Mexico in the three media of theatrically distributed film, movies free-to-air TV. Free-to-air is what we say now instead of broadcast TV, free TV, and streaming, to which foreign viewers have little access and of which they have no knowledge. Conversely, clearly, uh, Netflix is important. A word on Netflix is famous algorithm. This connects product, product innovation with customer personalization. Netflix tracks your consumption of its content as to genre, for example, I'm always being recommended romantic comedies. <laughs> they know something about my preferences, but also to location where those shows are, are located. So unfortunately, I was not given access to these valuable statistics. So my approach is more qualitative than quantitative. But then that was what I was asked to, to write about also. Um, so the full essays we published in this book uh, includes close readings of opening as episodes of three series. And what I'm attempting to do there is to connect formal analysis of TV text with the conditions of production and reception. I don't really have time to do that here today, but um, I, uh, I'll do that in the, in the long version of this talk. Now, as you saw, I started with a YouTube that stages a cultural encounter between Spain and the USA, I'm sorry, it didn't come out very well, but Paquita Salas arrives in the offices of Netflix in California. Um, and I'll explain that in a couple of minutes. So what I, I will attempt to do now is I have a modest PowerPoint, uh, which is just still images. And so I will um, attempt to share my screen. So the talk of the, uh, this name of the talk, the Spanish series in the age of Netflix and American perspective, 
And here I'm actually citing a Mexican book, which is called A Series Mexicanas in La Era de Netflix. There is a book already for Mexico. There is not yet a book. That will be our book on, uh, uh -huh. uh, on um, uh, series in Spain. So on uh, September the 4th, 2020, the New York Times ran an interview with Netflix Chief Executive Officer Reed Hastings by columnist Maureen Dowd, who's a famous columnist in the United States. Uh, she cited the supposed new democratization of media via streaming platforms, and she lists a number of Netflix's original international titles, including, quote, a Spanish, maybe you could turn off the dinging noise when people are admitted, it's possible to turn that off, uh, please, uh, including, quote, a Spanish period piece about phone operators, end quote. This is a brief mention of drama series Las Chicas del Cable, Cable Girls 2017 to 2020, which had just posted its last season on the streaming platform on Netflix. It's the only reference to Spain in this piece, but it's in the context of a supposed democratization of media. On October the 4th, 2017, Netflix España had posted uh, to its own YouTube uh, channel, a short promotional video called Paquita Sala Salatiega and Netflix comes to Netflix, which we just tried to show you. In it, a plump, pink-suited Spanish matron walks boldly into the streamer's headquarters in California. Confronting the bemused young receptionist, she tries out the only words of English uh, she appears to know, meeting, telephone, and boss. And here she is attempting to pronounce Netflix. Netflix. It's obviously humorous. Uh, that boss that she mentions would be the same Reed Hastings whom Maureen Dowd would interview so reverently later. The occasion is the adoption by Netflix or Netflix of the second season of the Spanish comedy series Paquita Salas, which had previously been seen only in Spain on a web platform and a cable channel. Telephone. Paquita Salas, which began in 2016, and there, there will be a fourth season coming soon, pandemic uh, allowing, uh, follows the mixed fortunes of a talent agent based in Getafe, which I might say is an, an unglamorous town south of Madrid, uh, which could not be further from flashy Silicon Valley. This culture clash is shown by means of linguistic lack of facility, the provincial Paquita's inability to master English. And this short video extends the Spanish series that's deceptively simple genre of mockumentary comedy, parachuting it from everyday Getafe into an exceptional American location. So the source of the humor from the Spanish perspective is clear. It comes from the embarrassment embodied by an incompetent local Spanish media embodied by Paquita Salas in the face of a highly successful global media phenomenon. Now, you didn't hear this because it didn't uh, play very well, but there's a very specific cultural marker here that Paquita says, well, when I'm in Spain, I have dinner at Paolo's house. So that she's trying to gain, gain entrance into Netflix's uh, head, headquarters. And so here she's referring to Paolo Vasile, who is the chairman of Teletinko, a media set, which is probably the most powerful, he is probably the most powerful figure in broadcast television in Spain and is therefore a direct rival to Netflix. Now this is an example of what is called cultural deficit for the US spectator. And unless you're a TV study specialist, nobody would know who Paolo Vasile is watching this, this clip. Um, and most viewers uh, prefer local content in a local language, which offers the so-called cultural premium known as proximity or closeness. So it's unusual that Spanish content should be popular in the United States. So public evidence for the US reception of these Spanish series, which is what I was asked to write about, uh, as opposed to Netflix's knowledge gleaned from its algorithm, which remains private, uh, public knowledge is limited and derives from three sources. So now I'm going to take you through the three sources that I used to write a piece. So number one is the trade press, which is Spanish is called Prensa Especializada, uh, such as Variety and Entertainment Weekly. Now, within the trade press, which is now all accessible online, 
This coverage is itself divided between specialist journalists, long located in Spain and highly knowledgeable of the local scene, and generalists based in Los Angeles, whose sole knowledge is of the US industry, and whose responsibility is to report on how the Spanish content fits in a US context. So the first, the specialists in the trade press are looking for what is new, different. The second are looking for what is familiar because they're trying to assimilate Spanish shows into a uh, uh, United States context for the local industry, the American industry. So the second source is the so-called general press, especially the New York Times. There is something in the Washington Post as well, but less. So the general press offers brief reviews guiding readers through the new labyrinth of streaming platforms. They are cultural gatekeepers that retain some influence, especially among elite audiences who are likely to have an interest in foreign language fare. So if you read the New York Times, you know that regular features include best shows on particular platforms, on Netflix, on Amazon. Alternatively, best foreign shows but also I'm interested in a, a continuing feature called how much watching time do you have directly addressing the reader. So if we put this in economic terms, then media content is revealed as a, what is called a positional good. A positional good is an item which serves to signal the status of the consumer. Are you the kind of person who watches foreign shows? That means you're smarter than those who don't. Probably you have, more, a higher income also. But it could also be said, read in terms of opportunity cost. How much time do you have? There is a potential loss owed to missed opportunity. For example, if I'm watching here, Tiempos de Guerra, which in, in the very banal translation is called Morocco uh, in English, I'm not watching, say, Italian uh, detective shows, which I really like. And there is a niche of Italian detective shows on, not on, uh, on Netflix, but on Amazon. So each nation has niches, niches, uh, which are, have a competitive advantage. So the third um, area is social media of evidence for US reception. Netflix attempts to direct the conversation. There are official uh, feeds for each show but it's relatively easy to identify genuine English language commentary from fans on say, discrete media events, such as the finale of Las Chicas del Cable, Cable Girls. This can be analyzed. What did people say about that ending, which was a very dramatic moment for all involved. So viewers writing in English, as I discovered when I did the research about Cable Girls, identify themselves sometimes as black women. There is dialogue amongst people who at least pose as black women uh, on Twitter, but also, and this is of interest for the Instituto de Cervantes, as Spanish language learners, and they dialogue amongst each other. Uh, and, and there was quite a lot of evidence for this, and for people who say, oh, I, I, um, they're very specific. For example, one said, I'm learning Spanish because I want to understand the interviews with the actresses in uh, Cable Girls, which apparently are not subtitled. No. Um, so from a search, do a search for a Spanish uh, titles, Spanish series on Netflix. You make it a lot of Mexican things, in fact. From a search on Netflix's opening menu, it would appear that Spanish produced titles do indeed favor female protagonists and female audiences. There seems also to be a correspondence between gender and genre. The many costume dramas boast lavish wardrobes and attractive set designs. Even, and here we have, a military hospital in the 1920s, Tiempos de Guerra, Morocco. Nice to know they could still take such care of their hats at the, in, <laughs> during a time of battle. Um, here's another show, Alta Mar, uh, High Seas. Uh, transatlantic ship in the 1940s. And I'm struck here by the, uh, the actress on the left with her Veronica leg hairstyle, which shows how uh, it's the producer Bamboo is trying to provide an equivalent for the, the glamour of Hollywood in the 1940s. Um, and here a very different kind of show, 45 RPM, which is the music industry in the 1960s. So pick a period and you will find a Spanish show set in it. 
But what's important here is this is not the case for all countries. Spain is distinctive here. So Netflix production in Mexico is the other main Spanish language market. This is not particularly female targeted. For example, narco dramas are not attractive to a female audience. Uh, and it's certainly not costume drama, uh, period. It's very contemporary. Uh, so Spain is distinctive here and they have already skills in producing excellent costume drama. A further category employed by Netflix itself, which coincides with Spanish series, is ensemble shows, which in Spanish is coral, you know, as if a chorus. So there isn't a single main character, there are many, many characters. Uh, and this is, as I, say, as I say, distinctively Spanish and has been for maybe 20 years of TV series in Spain. This is another competitive advantage for Spanish production and the ensemble show has a long and distinctive history on free to air TV in Spain. Netflix has based its European operation in Spain. So I say that as if it were perfectly natural, it's not. Why, why is it not in, in London or Paris or, or Berlin? It's not, it's outside Madrid. I've built its extensive studios, which are known in English as Content City, outside Madrid. And look how huge it is. There's a word in Spanish, Faronico, which is often used of uh, Francisco Franco's great projects. And this is truly pharaonic, you know. But then what ruler of ancient Egypt have built so much. Uh, it's just outside Madrid. The streamer, Netflix, thus has a special interest in the country. In the long version of this paper, I offer close readings of three case studies, a series made in Spain, but shown in the US. I place them on a continuum, or rather two continuums, from the most to the least Spanish. And by Spanish, I mean making explicit reference to Spain and inscribed in the conventions of Spanish TV drama and from the most to the least female. And by that, I mean cast with women actors addressed to women viewers and inscribed in the conventions of TV genres gendered as feminine, such as uh, costume drama, precisely. Of course, I'm not talking here about essential identities, but of empirical evidence of media content over two decades. So my three examples of Spanish fiction series that made it to Netflix's US prop platform are, and they, they may be on Netflix in the, in the USA, but they're not in, say, Britain. Because I told a friend in London, oh, you must watch Locked Up. And he said, we don't have it. It's not on Netflix here. So vis a -vis Locked Up from producer Global Media and distributor Antena 3 and later taken up by Spanish Fox. This is a show that was made for, explicitly for a Spanish audience, but came later to uh, Netflix. Uh, it's a women's prison drama that boasts a female ensemble cast and a central identification character, the blonde woman in the middle who later went on to uh, Cable Girls. Las Chicas del Cable Cable Girls, a period romance come mystery, also with a female ensemble cast from producer Bamboo and Antena Tres, and La Casa de Papel, Money Heist. What a banal title in English. I mean, I wouldn't watch a show called Money Heist I might watch a show called La Casa de Papel because it's enigmatic, poetic. Money Heist is just a terrible title. And yet it has worked all over the world. Um, Money Heist, as you know very well, is a crime thriller with a mixed gender cast, but arguably a female protagonist, the character Tokyo, uh, seen on, on the right here, uh, who is a well-known actress in Spain already. This is promoted as a Netflix original, but it's a problematic term. What is a Netflix original? Because Money Heist also made its debut on Antena 3, that is for a local public broadcast TV, before being picked up by the streamer. And one thing you will notice here is the key colors, yellow, turquoise, red. Huh? So this is a way of how do you get, there are thousands of shows uh, in this kind of avalanche. How do you stand out? Well, one way which Spanish is exploited very well is through the use of color. Uh, this helps a key, what's called key color. There is a key color in the costumes and the cars, uh, and it helps them to stand out in this avalanche of content. 
So in analyzing these three titles and here's some more bibliography, I draw on three critical commentaries. So Milly Buonanno is the best known scholar of television in Italy. She writes about Italian TV, but also more generally European TV, world TV. She has a book on the bad girls of global television, such as prison shows. Now this is new because uh, quality TV in the United States had been about, made by and about difficult men. You think of the Sopranos, Breaking Bad, where it's not just the protagonists of our men, troubled men, but also the people who made those shows were troubled men. So it's quite, it's relatively new around the world that there should be bad girls, complex female characters. And so recent Spanish production is inscribed in that tradition. Um, and that's how I read Visavi um, locked up. Um, there is a book on Spanish period drama, a scholarly book, and that places uh, Cable Girls in the context of its free-to-air TV predecessors. And this book is by David George and one Sonia Tang. So you, I would recommend that book too, because there isn't much written about this. And it shows how so-called Netflix shows are completely inscribed in the context of local production for local audiences. And also Netflix's own documentary on La Casa de Papel, uh, Money Heist. This examines the Spanish series as a global phenomenon. And it's interesting as a way of self-presentation. And interestingly, it doesn't focus particularly on the reception in the United States. It's more like to show, say, Saudi Arabia and the supposed political implications uh, of uh, La Casa de Papel in Saudi Arabia. But what we can say, these shows are very different from each other, of course, but in general, there's an increase in budgets over successive seasons. This permits more exterior and international shooting. For example, uh, Money Heist goes to Panama in the, in the, in the final season. Um, there are much bigger budgets. Conversely, um, the uh, control over the production shifts more to Madrid because now they have their facility in Madrid. Um, so this is rather complex. But it's not the case that the Americans control these Spanish shows, that the green light and all the cultural decisions are made from Madrid, or indeed Galicia, which I'll go into in a minute. Moreover, the final season of uh, Cable Girls is set in the Spanish Civil War. This requires a modicum of knowledge of Spanish history and geography, you know, the fact that there was a Spanish Civil War. Um, and as I'll mention later, Madrid's Gran Vía famous road in the center of Madrid recurs in all three series. Um, there is then a sense of place that is preserved to some extent. Um, so let's look at this. This is the opening. Um, oh yeah, I'll, I'll take this now. This is the opening sequence of vis a -vis, um, Locked Up and shows the character in middle class character about to be sent to prison and it shows her in her glamorous apartment above the Gran Vía. It never specifies where she is or what she's doing because it expects the Spanish audience to recognize it. Here, uh, the, the Gran Vía in Cable Girls, the main character arrives in this beautifully uh, recreated Gran Vía of the 1920s. Um, and uh, she's going to a specific uh, building, which is the Telefonica building, slightly different in this digital recreation. Um, but um, it's very uh, handsome the way it's done and very expensive. And here we have uh, the Plata Callao, uh, which is just off the Gran Vía. And this is where uh, a money high shot of a spectacular scene in which millions of uh, euros uh, were thrown, supposedly, <laughs> were thrown out of helicopters down onto the audience below. But I'm, I show you this because the uh, Cines Callao, the movie theatre is called Callao, is sort of central glamorous of places uh, where the, they hold premieres, etrenos, of the uh, series, the first episodes of the series. And what this shows is that how television is taken over from cinema as being the most glamorous and the most exciting medium in Spain. But this is not because of Netflix, because when I lived in Madrid in 2009, I remember walking down the Gran Vía. It was a huge group, you know, a crowd of young people and, and a premiere. And I thought, 
finally, Spanish cinema is connected with a youth audience, and it wasn't. It was the premiere of a TV series called Physica or Chimica, Physics or Chemistry, which was a network show for a Spanish audience uh, and a, um, a high school show. And many of those actors and actresses from Physica or Chimica are now in the so-called Netflix shows. But really, they're not. They're Spanish or Catalan actors, and, and that's their background. They're not Netflix actors. So my, my main point then is that the origins, origins of so-called Netflix content are in Spanish broadcast TV and the independent production companies that have made it. Netflix didn't know how to make television. They were looking around the world to find people who, who did know how to make it. The international success of these series did not appear likely. And so now I'm going, going on to a new section of the talk, given the unique characteristics of Spanish series in that home environment. So what was Spanish TV like before the rise of uh, streaming? A bit of background on recent TV history. Spanish broadcast series have until very recently employed lengthy episodes of well over an hour, far exceeding the international standard. So imagine you're watching old style TV at home, you would take up the whole evening with commercial breaks. Spanish series required larger casts because if they're very long shows, they need that ensemble, which was later transferred to Netflix. They also have more intricate plot lines to hold the attention of their patient viewers. Now the period genre, costume drama, is more common in Spain than in the United States. What is most typical of the United States um, network TV is police procedural, which is contemporary and very masculine in focus. Um, uh, so the period genre requires a passing knowledge of Spanish history of its audience, even in titles that took place in hermetic locations like Grand Hotel and another um, bamboo show or the transatlantic liner in Altamara Pisces. In Altamara, they're constantly saying, after the war, now we're after the war. And you think, well, which war is that? So they're rather imprecise about the time and, and the place, but clearly it's World War II, not the, the, the Civil War. So these series are a kind of test case for national or transnational definition of Spanish production. Because both of them, Gran Hotel and High Seas, are made by Bamboo, a production company based in Galicia, in fact, not in Madrid. Gran Hotel was produced before the streaming platforms existed for a local broadcast audience. Although it was remade, there was, a, for example, a Mexican remake with the same name, Gran Hotel. Um, Altamar, High Seas, was made afterwards for Netflix. Yet both follow the same formula. If you read uh, uh, specialist websites for Spain, they talk about the formula of bamboo, which is lush period setting, distinctive hybrid genre of romance and murder mystery. I can guarantee that in any series made by this production company, Bamboo, there will be a, a bloody murder in the first episode. And, and this is rather curious because it's also delightful costume drama with beautiful clothes and setting. So Spanish drama on free-to-air TV also appealed to the country's established star system with actresses familiar to local audiences from film and TV. For example, Blanca Suarez in Cable Girls was already very well known to Spanish audiences, not to American audiences, or veteran Pancho Velasco in Grand Hotel had 50 years of credits in Spain. Finally, and crucially, recent Spanish dramas appeal to concrete locations in the peninsula. Now, the best person writing about Spanish television in Spain now is Concepcion Cascajosa, so the Carlos del Ferro University. So she wrote, Spanish series used to take place in a vague series planet. Nobody knew exactly where they were. Now they are set in places recognizable to Spanish audiences, often in the regions, not in Madrid or Barcelona. So Cascajosa also cites something new, the neglect of La Señora de Cuenca, the lady from Cuenca. Now, who was this mysterious lady from Cuenca? Now, Cuenca is a small provincial town. And when Spaniards used to make TV, the important thing was not to um, disturb the lady from Cuenca, who was thought to have very traditional tastes. In recent Spanish series, this is no, they're no longer 
afraid to offend traditional so-called family audience. Chris Davi locked up is shocking in many ways. I think it would be shocking to an American broadcast audience, network audience. Or a recent show, Farinha, is a drug smuggling series set in Galicia, which is em emblematic of these trends in Spanish network TV. You can see it on Netflix as Cocaine Coast. Uh, but it's kind of hidden away. I thought they didn't have Farinha because the, the English translation Cocaine Coast and the Spanish title does not appear. So um, I already cited then this, the role of a single location recognizable to Spaniards, but not to Americans in all the three main series I'm studying here, which is Madrid's Gran Via. But a further point would be that, as I said before, this opening sequence of vis a -vis, they don't have to establish where it is. They don't tell you where it is here. There's a voiceover in which Alba, the main character, explains to you what the Gran Via is. She explains that this is a new building, that it's a skyscraper imitating American skyscrapers. She fills you in on everything. So it's much more explicit and directed. And I take that to be an awareness of the American audience, which needs, or well, global audience, which means needs more direction and guidance than the local Spanish audience. Um, So all these tendencies would seem to alienate international audiences, because if Spaniards suddenly are making shows about particular places in Spain, then uh, why would Americans want to see them? But what happened is that these shows also testify to the professionalism and virtuosity of long-lasting producers. And here the key figure is Alex Pina, who created um, uh, Money Heist, but he had 20 years experience on broadcast Spanish TV, going back to Periodistas, journalists, was the first example of quality Spanish TV series in 2000, which was made for a local audience. And that's why I began to write on Spanish TV, because I loved Periodistas, and I could see it was something new, quality TV in Spain. Uh, but also because Netflix knew there were these production companies which had a very long uh, track record Globo Media, which has no connection with Globo in Brazil. Globo Media had pivoted from family-friendly dramedies. There was one famous one, again, 20 years ago, called Medico de Familia, to the brutal prison drama vis-a-vis -vis locked up. So they show they can make many kinds of series. Um, most important production company is Bamboo of Cable Girls, which specializes in costume drama. And this is rare even in Spain because one of the two founders of Bamboo is female, and she's called Teresa Fernandez Valdez. And if you go to their website, you'll see that exactly half of all the creative staff is, is female. So on the one hand, the formal properties of Spanish series, such as extended episode length, were alien to US audiences. On the other, the industrial proficiency of Spanish companies was welcome to Netflix, which was a new entrant to the global market. And they had peaked in the United States and suddenly they were dependent on foreign markets. The growth comes in foreign markets. Uh, and so the evident efficiency of Spanish TV producers, the fact that industrially they were a model uh, for the world goes against the stereotype of Spain, which we saw in Paquita Salas, where she's completely incompetent. And even uh, stereotypes the Spaniards tell against themselves. Now, there's an excellent show in Spain, El Ministerio del Tiempo, The Ministry of Time. You cannot see this on Netflix because it comes to the accident that it was made by the public service broadcaster. So we have a very distorted idea of what TV means in Spain if we live in the US because we cannot see this really important show, Ministry of Time, uh, which is rewriting Spanish history through time travel. But they have a very funny line there where they say, what will we do? And the answer is, we're Spaniards, let's improvise. So this is a sort of stereotype the Spaniards have of themselves, self-mocking. Uh, and it's not true at all within television production, because television production in Spain is at a global level. It was already at a global level before the emergence of Netflix and Amazon. So let's go on to the limited... US media coverage, such as this, of series from Spain, 
because it offers valuable evidence for reception. Unsurprisingly, perhaps, this coverage exhibits twin tensions <coughs> sorry, between the national and the international and between the female and the universal. And the key figure here is someone called John Hope. John Hope, 30 years ago, wrote a book about Spanish cinema after Franco. He has been the specialist in Spanish language media in the trade press for all this time. And so I would like to say he is a great scholar of Spanish language media, not just in Spain, but also throughout Latin America. And he is the correspondent in Variety, John Hopewell. So he describes new TV titles to an American audience in Variety in wholly Spanish terms. He points out that the, the previous track record in Spain. For example, if he writes about Elite, Elite, it's a high school show, he knows that the producers of Elite had previously made Physico Chimica. Um, and so he thinks this is important to, to let Americans know this. The opposite point of view to that of Hopewell, so this is, is what I'm showing here now, variety on so-called teen tropes. This is international focused. Netflix's elite subverts teen drama tropes with style. And these teen drama tropes are wholly American. So the only reference is to shows like Gossip Girl, show you may remember a teen show, and how this is not the same as Gossip Girl, or well, maybe because it's Spanish, you know, why would, it, why would it be the same? But the way this journalist writes is to assimilate it to an, um, an American uh, media context. So what Hopewell asks, and so it's very interesting because I had a class yesterday and I was teaching this, it's nice some of the students are here, is that there's this fear of Americanization of cultural imperialism. What Hopewell says, and he documents this because he is scholarly, how Netflix grew Spain's cable girls as it evolved itself. So there's a parallel development between um, the, um, the, the changes in the series cable girls and Netflix's development as a company. And as I said before, in the final series of, of Cable Girls, all creative decisions were taken from Madrid. And it was a more Spanish season in quotes because it was about the Civil War. Um, another thing that Hope on notes is the promotion, and this is of interest for uh, the Instituto de Cervantes, the promotion of the peninsula idiom, Spanish, Spanish in Latin America because he writes that these are the first series to be shown in Latin America without being dubbed into so-called neutral Spanish. So neutral Spanish, entre comillas, means Mexican, but without Mexicanisms. Uh, so when we're talking about dubbing, it's not just dubbing from, say, Spanish into English, it's also dubbing from Castilian Spanish into Mexican Spanish. And these shows are not. I, I cannot tell you how astonished I was a couple of years ago in Mexico to turn on the TV and see vis a -vis cable girls on Azteca. Azteca is, a, is the second um, biggest uh, broadcast channel in Mexico. And, and it was extraordinary, the home of traditional telenovela to show this brutal uh, Spanish women's prison drama. And also with the very Spanish idiom which I can guarantee most, Spanish, most Mexicans are not familiar with. Um, so uh, the Castilian accent has not always been welcome in Latin America. A another anecdote, I'm in Mexico City. I, uh, many Mexicans still watch television. They watch Netflix shows on pirate DVD. So I go up to a vendor in the street and I say, La Casa de, and he says immediately, La Casa de Papel, money heist. And I could guarantee that a few years earlier, he had never heard of a single show on Spanish TV. And the, the irony was that I wanted La Casa de las Flores, House of Flowers, which was a Mexican show. Because I wanted to see if there were differences between the DVD, pirate DVD sold on the street and the way it was being shown on the streamer. Um, so if we're talking about cultural reach of Spain, it's also within Latin America in a new way. So in a recent interview, um, I'll add later. In a recent interview with Hopewell, Alex Pina, who you remember is the creator of uh, Money Heist, says that he is Latino and proud of it. Again, this is a kind of extraordinary thing for a Spaniard to say. 
but it's not self-evident that Spaniards connect with Latinx community in the United States. Clearly, he's positioning himself uh, to make connections with Latin America and with Spanish audiences in the US. Now, what Alex Pina says is the heist genre is Anglo-Saxon, but his series offers greater affective dynamics. <coughs> that is more intense emotions. And he says that these intense emotions are typically Latin. Now, this is very problematic because it's playing in, into all kinds of stereotypes. But what interests me is that this is how he's promoting his, his series from Madrid to the world as being Latin and as being emotional. Uh, but it also tells you something about the mixed genre of the show. You may remember that uh, uh, Money Heist is many action, but the action, again, according to his, his, the producer's own stereotypical view, is for the male audience, but the elements of romance for the female. Uh, and so Variety documents the shooting of a kiss, a single kiss between Tokyo, the female character, and one of the male characters on a beach in Panama. So they create this very romantic, exotic setting, and that's intended for the female audience. Um, but Hopewell also focuses on these linguistic details accessible to audiences in the peninsula, uh, because he knows Spanish very well. Um, and these are cultural markers. So even as uh, Money Heist shoots in Panama, they're sticking with those actors who are uh, by nationality Spanish or Catalan and bring their accents and their particular way of speaking with them as they travel around the world. Um, so clearly the producers and actors featured in, in uh, the trade publications, they're looking for the broadest audience possible for their series and that when they're interviewed, that's what they're doing. This sense is confirmed by the brief notices in the US general press who are also anxious to promote little known foreign language titles to the elite readers as a sign of distinctive taste amongst the new deluge of TV titles. It has to be said that they do all, however, patronize Spanish content, which the trade press doesn't do. For example, the New York Times called Cable Girls a soap opera. I don't think it's a soap opera. Uh, it also praises their jaunty hats. So it focuses on that detail of the hats. They do indeed have great hats, but I think this is fully legitimate to defend the visual pleasure of periods series and the wardrobe is important to do and important to do well. You can see two jaunty hats here. It doesn't mean it's, it, it doesn't mean it cannot be serious as well and the issues it's raising. Um, but uh, there is a, certainly a visual pleasure. Many people on Twitter write, I love the, the, the lipstick of a character in a particular episode. Where can I get this lipstick? This means they're watching very closely. They can tell that Alma has changed the shade of lipstick. Um, these are not casual viewers. They're very close viewers. Um, another uh, journalist in New York Times says the money heist is, I quote his actual words, en el estilo de Quentin Tarantino. So he says en el estilo de in Spanish, but he says, well, really it's just like uh, an American film director. I think, well, how much do we give the Americans? No. Is any kind of action show um, American by definition? I don't think so. On the other hand, these uh, commentators in the New York Times recommend that their readers, American viewers, watch in the original Spanish dialogue and not the dubbed version. So clearly that helps to promote Spanish language in non-Spanish speakers, elite audiences in the United States. So what do viewers themselves make of the series? The most interesting evidence for US fandom comes from responses to the final season of uh, Cable Girls in 2020. I haven't seen this, so pre please don't tell me what happens. But apparently it's devastating that the whole audience was just, they, they barely survived that. So in my class yesterday, a student cited a New York Times article which says that 72% of American viewers watch the dubbed version of Money Heist. But in what I've read of Twitter, of Cable Girls, there's a lot of focus on the language and the voices of the actors by English speakers. So I think they are not watching uh, the dubbed version. Um, 
yet, um, um, so Netflix is known for being very professional in dubbing. There isn't really a great tradition of dubbing in the United States. Uh, because the few people who saw foreign language film wanted to see the original version. Uh, but I'm struck that they make these very basic errors in translation. The first episode of Vis a Vis, um, A Locked Up, is called On the Streamer. This title comes up, Dead Mosquito. And this is a flagrant mistranslation of the Spanish idiom, Mosquita Muerta. And I thought, please, Netflix. Netflix is often considered to be, you know, omniscient because of their uh, algorithm and their, their, their immense power globally. They can't even translate Mosquita Muerta. Surely somebody could have told them what that meant. They should go to the Instituto Cervantes and, and take classes <laughs> at the very least. Uh, they also made some truly dreadful shows. Um, and one a Mexican example would be Made in Mexico, which is was a you know an embarrassingly bad reality series. So how did the algorithm recommend they make this appalling series? Uh, recently, Emily in Paris. I don't know if any of you've seen Emily in Paris. This was a kind of a slap in the face, an insult to France to French viewers. Uh, France is a really important market for for Netflix. How could they make such a show, which is just full of stereotypes of? Uh, of, of Parisians and where the naive American girl goes, but somehow manages to tell the Parisians where they're wrong. So I think we could, we grant too much intelligence to Netflix uh, and, and to their algorithm. So to get back to the cable girls, some viewers on, on Twitter, Twitter is easy to analyze. Um, uh, some viewers offer lists of favorite broadcast shows where Cable Girls is the only foreign title. So this shows that it's the one thing that broke through to them as a Spanish uh, show and it, and it comes to new English speaking audiences. Other uh, people who choose to post uh, on, on Twitter, which means they're a very engaged fan. Um, it's the very fact that they post on Twitter. They attest to a deep emotional engagement with the series and an, an intense identification with its characters. I'm talking here of people who write in English. For example, and this I was—I almost cried when I read this. Um, I waited two months to watch the final episodes to avoid how emotional I would feel, knowing this would be the end of the road with our cable girls. End quote. So imagine writing, because it's—it's it's thought that the joy of streaming is you have immediate access. This is a, a someone who says that she waited two months to see it because she could not bear for it to come to an end, the show. Um, so there's a recent book by Charo Lacalle, who's in, in Barcelona, and it's called Jóvenes y Ficción Televisiva. And she calls this phenomenon extimidad, extimacy. That is the sharing of private emotions in public space via social media in relation to television. Um, and note that this is the opposite, that television was often stigmatized as being the object of distraction that people weren't really watching very closely. This is not the case. Many fans are obsessed with these Spanish series. And also the extended temporality of serial television, that it can go on for a long time. Even if all the episodes of one season drop, this was a period of several years. Uh, so um, other... Uh, Viewers uh, run with a series of avowedly feminist messaging. Cable Girls is embarrassingly obvious with telegraphing its fe feminist uh, messaging from the very first scene. I'll quote one thing, which is rather scary. Dude, this is a fan writing after the final episode. Dude, I've been watching Cable Girls all day, and God knows how much I despise men now. Another person writes, Presumably, well, these are people who identify as American women, but they may not be, it's Twitter. You don't have to give your real name. Another one says, I really want to kill all men now. So that was a bit scary, uh, having watched the, um, the final season of Cable Girls. Um, so what Twitter attests to is how English-speaking audiences, overwhelmingly female, integrate the successive seasons of Cable Girls 
in their lives in a rather moving way. And so I, you see this uh, here from someone who calls herself Valerie, uh, the first and the last time, and it shows the stars in the first episode and then the last episode, and how the, the slight aging of these youthful stars, three years between the opening and closing sequences, mirrors, no doubt, the life of the person writing about this and her engagement with the series over the three years. Now, this is what Charola Calle, the Spanish scholar of television fiction, calls a space of deliberation. The viewer reflects on the series. She reflects on herself, and she reflects on the relation between the two. This time in the case of temporality, how many years have passed the first time, the last time. And so um, people have asked me what are useful criteria for discriminating in, when you're analyzing social media posts. So one is extimacy, this display of public, in public, of private emotion. Another is deliberation. People are working through what the fiction means to them in their lives. So just to summarize on US reception, we saw first the trade press explains national references or international parallels to a professional audience. It's mainly for the industry. The general press recommends superficial pleasures of wardrobe and plot with its busy readers. How much time have you got? But in spite of its reputation for triviality, social media attests rather to uh, the immersive affective experience of female fan communities, which leads some even to explore the original language of favorite characters they cannot bear to lose intimate contact with. And these are those tweets by people who are learning Spanish in order to understand cable girls better and in order to feel closer to the actresses in the series. So to conclude, in a further short video, when you see the, the, the clip here, uh, Paquita Salas wanders through the offices of Netflix in California. And this is shot as mockumentary and it looks like the poor uh, the unfortunate uh, employees don't know what's going on because they're clearly not familiar with the show. Um, where, Paquita asks, is the boss? One employee responds in English, Reed Hastings, he's everywhere. Like God, he's the God of Netflix. Um, so Paquita remarks slightly in Spanish, so clearly, as she pronounced it, Reed Heislin, um, can't be bothered to come into work. Uh, once more, there's an ironic awareness of this continuing culture clash between the two countries. A recent profile in The Economist is also skeptical about the management style of the same Reed Hastings, which is employing to achieve a global media giant. We just say here that the important person for us is not him, but Ted Sarandos, who is the head of content. Ted Sarandos travels around the world and produces pitch to him. And he says things like, we don't want uh, science fiction from Latin America to one producer. And then the next year, they make a, a science fiction series in Brazil. So there is not a great deal of consistency in their planning. Um, the article in The Economist calls attention to public pressure on Netflix, which they say is hyper-masculine. It's a very macho environment, and that they need to care more about diversity. This is ironic because you may remember I came, began with an interview uh, with Reed Hastings in the New York Times where the interviewer praised streaming for its diversity. So the three test cases that we've talked about, the Spanish shows, show a trend of progressive adaptation from most to least female and most to least Spanish national. So there's clearly here a loss of particularity, but perhaps a gain in universality. This is Netflix's public policy, and it's a lesson that Spanish producers seem to have quickly learned. Netflix says constantly and unexpectedly, we are, met, we are what we show are universal shows for the whole world. But, and this is the important thing, we've discovered from examining the US reception of those series that Spanishness as a cultural marker can be a competitive advantage for trade, general and fan audiences alike, especially when combined with female targeting. Spanish series can also be seen in the United States 
as aspiring to intersectionality, as when the New York Times cites Netflix's supposed democratization of media via cable girls. Now, Alex Pina, the showrunner who shifted from the local uh, locked up to the global um, money heist is exemplary here. He changed focus. And it's perhaps by presenting themselves, presenting their productions as Latinx, that Spaniards will find the key to continue conquering the American market to carrying out a heist that is as much as much cultural and linguistic as it is monetary. Thanks very much. That's it. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for asking me. So are there any questions? I haven't seen any on the chat. No, no anything? chat. No? I don't know if anybody would ask, shy. ask a question now. Sure. I have yeah, OK. A Off you go. Grand Britland. Hello. Hello. Lovely chat. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was thinking how you were talking a lot about how the Spanish um, original Netflix series do have more of a stronger female focus, you know, cable girls, vis a vis. And, I, and I was, as I've been reading more, I've been wondering, perhaps, do you think that's due maybe to the internal competition in Spain between Netflix and Movie Star Plus with series like Collection Velvet that is on Netflix, but also all of their other series too? Well, thank you very much, because I didn't um, talk about that, that within Spain, the, the situation is very complex. So what I was asked to write about was the American um, reception. And I found it was very difficult to talk about American reception without acknowledge, acknowledging these were Spanish series made originally for a Spanish market, many of them. Um, I mean, Movistar is, is very interesting. You raised that as a platform in Spain um, because they are very explicit. If you look at their website, they're making female shows for female audiences. Uh, so a recent show of theirs, Are de Madrid, I'm not sure how it was translated, Madrid on fire, Madrid is burning which is about Ava Gardner, the, the American film star in Madrid in the 1960s, fantastic show. I'm not sure if there's access to it in, in the USA, but it was made within that context and it has, well, it has two um, ex, um, showrunners and one of them is, is a woman. And um, another show, which I think is very important is, well, maybe the competition with Televisión Española, which has forgotten the heritage public broadcaster is still very productive. I mentioned Ministry of Time, which is, again, explicitly feminist, lesbian show, um, amongst other things. Um, and, but also uh, there was a, um, a recent series which was set in a girls' school in the 1920s. Looks very much like, uh, uh, and it's called La Otra Mirada another look, I think it is in English, but we don't have access to it here because it came from Televis Española. This is a female ensemble and it has, it's very significant for the way that period series can comment on current situations because it's the main plot line in the first season, although it's set in the late 20s, is about uh, La Manada, that is a horrific gang rape which took place very recently in Spain. So everything that the female character has to go through there is relates back to La Manada, which will be very current in... Um, it also has a wonderful lesbian plot line uh, where it acknowledges the impossibility of being a lesbian in the 1920s. Uh, unlike Chicas de Cable, well, Cable Girls, what I've seen is, is, is more forgiving. Um, to the lesbian characters. Um, so you're absolutely right that it has, that Spain is a very competitive market in itself. And so the heritage broadcaster, uh, public broadcaster, the, the free to wear companies which make cinema as well as television, and then the new streamers, both Spanish streamers and, and international streamers are all competing for a, a limited audience. Um, and I, I think what they found is what they are looking for is, in Spanish is called fidelización, to make faithful. They need to make faithful uh, the audience. And for broadcast TV, this means tuning in every same time, every night uh, every, on the same day of the week. But Netflix needs that as well because they have what's called churn. 
the people register, they sign up, and then they uh, sign off. And they need to make audiences faithful also. Um, and women are more faithful. Mm -hmm. you? <laughs> uh -huh. What a surprise. Women are faithful audiences. They pay attention. They know Alma's wearing new new lipstick this time. Oh. And I, my, a whole of my work is to take that seriously because it's a sort of parasocial relationship to the audience um, and the fictional world. And perhaps the stereotypical man watches Money Heist for the action scenes. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how the producers understand it anyway. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there are women who love the action scene and men who love the romance. I'm more romantic myself. Uh, but um, so it's quite interesting how this question of gender intersects with uh, genre, uh, period shows directed mainly to a female audience, but which can raise urgent social issues of the present. Mm. So thank you. But Maurice Tarplus, a very important producer. Mm. Mm. Thank you very much. Thank you for your question. Any other questions? Would anybody else like to ask a question? Yeah, I would. I have a question. Um, thank you. Hello. Thank you so much for that insightful talk. Um, I was wondering if you could, though, speak a little bit more about the proliferation of period dramas specifically, because there's so many. And even like, would you consider Ministry of Time and always dealing with the past in every single episode, sort of like a, you know, avant-garde period drama in many ways? And just why period dramas? Are they trying to like satisfy American viewers who want this European past, or just what? What are your ideas about that? Oh, thank you very much, because as you can see, it's such an important genre. And um, well, I, 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 my research has shown this, that this existed long before streaming. And um, what I like to do is often uh, compare Spain and Mexico, because in some ways they have a lot in common, for example, the language. But already before streaming started, Spanish period shows were the most popular in Spain. And in Mexico, in some years, there have been no costume dramas whatsoever, everything is contemporary. We might say telenovela is kind of fictional. It doesn't seem very realistic sometimes, but it's nominally set in the present. And um, so, but if you're interested in these things, there is a, an annual survey called Obitel, O-B-I-T-E-L. And if you Google it, it will come up in uh, uh, that they have a survey each year for all of the Spanish and Portuguese speaking countries, which includes the United States. That's how I know that in certain years in Mexico, there are no period series, whereas in Spain, there are many. So this would seem to coincide with a particular interest in, in Spanish audiences, but also the fact that Spanish production companies have um, a great uh, expertise in making that kind of show, which of course is very difficult. In, a, in a, a contemporary show, in theory, they don't do this, but in theory, you could just go out on the street and shoot. Uh, in a period show, you have to either have physical sets or digital reconstructions, which is how they did the Gambia in um, Cable Girls. Uh, now, this is kind of ironic because uh, many cultural studies scholars of Spain talk about lack of memory and uh, that the Spanish refuse to confront the past. And I think, do they watch TV? Because you could spend <laughs> still that real TV, broadcast TV exists. I haven't talked about the afternoon shows. There are daily shows, which are almost all period set. They're mm. for a female audience and they're set at different periods. Mm. Main, well, actually very often in the 20s or 30s, so not in the Civil War itself, uh, but um, before. Uh, so I would say which comes first, you know? The, but there is obviously evidently a need mm. for these shows. Uh, in Spain, which it would appear in Mexico there isn't. An example of this is the Grand Hotel. Grand Hotel is set about 1910. Several of lovely costumes. Um, and uh, it was a huge hit in Spain. They take it to Mexico, also set in 1910, which means something different because they're going to have a revolution in 1910. And, and there are much more violent social conflicts and differences between classes. Mexico. And it was a, you know, a ratings failure in Spain, it, in Mexico, sorry, it didn't work, even though they tried to adapt, adapt it to a Mexican context. So that would have suggested that there is, on the one hand, an especial interest among Spanish audiences for period shows, and but also a competitive advantage in Spanish production, 
for making period shows and to send them out into the world. Uh, uh, but as I say, in general, there, there are, are, but this is even true of, say, a show like Gran Hotel, which was made originally just for a Spanish audience. It's very vague about history. The website will tell you it's 1910. You watch it, you have no idea. I mean, the fact that electricity arrives in the hotel in the first episode, this gives you a pretty good idea what the period is. Uh, but then I'm struck with Cable Girls made by the same company, Bamboo, many years later. And, and what is the first episode is the Telegraph, mm -hmm. the first Telegraph from Madrid to the United States. Mm -hmm. So that's clearly a sort of address to the American viewer. But it's actually very close to another show made by the same production company. So if we were to uh, uh, Deacon's word to analyze closely the current shows, we'd see the so-called Netflix shows made in Spain. They're very similar to Spanish shows that were made for uniquely Spanish audiences. Uh, a tiny example, if you watch the opening episode of Money Heist, La Casa de Papel, the character Tokyo calls her mother and um, in the first few minutes. And she knows she has to go away very soon because she's committed a crime and she'll go into hiding. And this is exactly the same scene as in Locked Up Vis a Vis, where the character in that beautiful apartment over the Grand Vier calls her mother and says, oh, I'm going to be going away for a while. She's going to prison. Uh, Tokyo in Money Heist is going to that weird academy where she learns how to be a master criminal. Uh, but it's, you see that this, the show that was made for Spanish audiences is in some ways exactly the same as the show that was made for international audiences. So thank you for your question. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, I think there's something in the chat. Oh, good. <laughs> so shall, shall I read yes, it out? Yeah, you, re you read it, yeah. Yeah, so from Julio Talavera, have you noticed, have you observed any difference in how Spanish productions for heritage media and those for streaming services reach Hispanic audiences in the US? As far as I know, content from Spain and Spanish speaking networks in the US is almost non-existent. <coughs> so thank you very much for this. I was not asked to write about that. No. <laughs> I was asked specifically to concentrate on English speakers and to show how, whether it was true that these shows from Spain helped the uh, promotion of the Spanish language and the Spanish culture amongst English speakers in the United States. Uh, but this is very interesting, um, I'm afraid. I have not done research, but of course, the, uh, the Spanish language um, networks in the United States have relationships with, with Mexico. Mm -hmm. Most of their content comes from Mexico. Some of it is made in, in Miami. So it is indeed the case that they, wouldn't, they would not show content from Spain. And this is why I was so surprised when I was in Mexico itself and I turned on the TV and I see Vis a Vis, the show which is so alien to a Mexican audience. Um, and so my, off the top of my head, I would say that these, um, that the streaming services are clearly open um, to, to all. Uh, I'm, I don't have any uh, knowledge, Netflix would have the knowledge of whether Spanish speaking audiences in the US, Latinx audiences are watching shows from Spain. I'm afraid I don't have that. But I do know just anecdotally that audiences in Latin America are definitely watching Spanish shows. Whereas in the past they had, I would say even, well, a lack of interest or even hostility, outright hostility to the Castilian accent. Mm -hmm. mm. Good. Any other questions? Algo más. Incluso en, en español. Cualquier variedad de español. <laughs> <laughs> Mexicano, yeah. castellano, cubano. I, mean, I myself am interested in what you said about the control, the, the, um, the production control of, the, mm -hmm. of Netflix. I was very interested. If, if I understood correctly, uh, um, I, I gathered that the, the control is left to the Madrid, to the studios, to the headquarters in Madrid, yes? Not from yeah. Madrid, which is interesting 
before me because I studied musicals and how they are exported from Broadway and the West End to Spain. Okay, and yeah. it's the opposite. The production yeah. is completely controlled by the source production yeah. company, you see? Yeah. So they even the costume, mm. the, uh, the staging, everything, the, the, the makeup, everything is exactly the same as in Broadway or the West End. And the production side is completely controlled by, in this case, the US companies or the British companies. So mm -hmm. um, they don't really... This, this is Deliver, uh, yeah. Thank you so much because I didn't know that and I was very aware, well, seen here in Maslecos, the Gran Via, where they had the Lion King for many yeah. years mm -hmm. and it kind of took over the Gran Via. And so it's only maybe the last 10 years that these transnational musicals have been huge hits. Yeah. And, oh, yes, yeah. Yeah, and, and I didn't realize that there was so much control over the content. Now, what job? 20 years, I'd say. 20, 20 years. years. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. Because some of them are, are local themes, you know, a yeah. Me Meccano musical. For now, now they yeah. are, yes. Yeah. Mm. But, but many are not. Um, yeah. And um, so I, I, I didn't understand how that licensing worked, and you have told yeah. me. But yeah. please. So it is clearly a parallel with, the, with TV formats yeah. and how they circulate. But what um, is a shame is that they don't rely on Spain for the dubbing. <laughs> Since Spain yeah. is a strong country in dubbing and it, and it has such good quality dubbing students and such strong tradition of dubbing. You're absolutely um, right, the way since Franco, mm -hmm. <laughs> as we all yeah. know, the Franco imposed dubbing as a, a form of censorship to mm -hmm. Spanish audiences and, and Spanish mm -hmm. professionals have great expertise in dubbing. Mm -hmm. And you're absolutely right. That's, but I think Netflix also wants to take control over the dubbing. Mm -hmm. Which means to me it's so strange that they can make these elementary errors in Spanish, yeah. such yeah. as dead mosquito. Mm -hmm. We I have a, Garen... we have one of the best experts in dubbing in, in, in Europe here today. Oh, I don't wow. know whether he would like to comment on anything. But yeah. you, you have to more questions. Uh, yeah, that's right. So can, shall I read this out? Su Yin Haynes. Thank you so much for this interesting talk. You're welcome. I was interested to learn more about this idea of Netflix original content. And it's very good that you put this in, in quotation marks because it's a, a very complex category and a diverse category when actually these series are created by Spanish production companies for Spanish audiences. Do you think this will continue or do you think Netflix will lead more towards working with and commissioning more individual international talent in multi-year deals as they have done with Manolo Caro? So I'll get back to Manolo Caro, but you may remember Alex Pina I talked to you about who was the producer for 20 years in Spanish broadcast TV, and then with Money Heights, suddenly has become a global figure. And they have an individual, Netflix has an individual deal with him. Uh, so it would be interesting to see whether those shows become more global or more Latinx, as he is suggesting to Variety. Um, but uh, so let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, dear Manolo Caro. Manolo Caro is a Mexican originally film director who is known for making romantic comedies. Uh, interestingly, some of those romantic comedies, uh, maybe they had a transgender character, or often they had a, a, a certain link with Spain, so there would be a Spanish actor or the characters would go to Spain. Now, uh, what he, when he transitioned into Netflix and the series, it was with uh, La, La Casa de las Flores, House of Flowers, where once more there are transgender characters and there is great prominence of Spain, Spanish actors, and also, I'm not sure if he actually shot in Spain, but in the, in the second season, there were a lot of scenes set in Spain. The characters go to Madrid, and uh, they're living there as a family, as it were. Um, so, again, Manolo Caro did not suddenly come into being when, when Netflix arrived. He already had a track record, I think also in legitimate theater, that is theater on stage in, in Mexico, but in, um, in feature film. And many of the characteristics of his feature films, those romantic comedies uh, are in his, uh, in La Casa de las Flores. La Casa de las Flores also works off evidently traditions of telenovela through the casting. So it's quite localized Mexican in that way. It's very reminiscent of Almodovar. Uh, so it has that Spanish influence also. Conversely, Manolo Caro, I don't know if you saw this recent series of his, which is called Alguien Tiene Que Morir. 
and has Carmen Maura, beloved Carmen Maura in it, Someone Has to Die. So this is a radical change in tone and genre. It's shot all in Spain. It's very reminiscent of Spanish cinema of the 1980s, set in, under Francoism. It's rural, it's very serious, it's very violent. It has a gay theme, uh, which is a, a constant in Manolo Caro, to his credit, is, He's always there at Mexican gay uh, LGBTQ events, etc. Um, but to see what is the connection between someone has to die in La Casa de las Flores, much less these very florid romantic comedies used to make, it, it's not clear. So the fact that Netflix has a continuing production deal with Manolo Caro does not predict what kind of shows he will make, um, I think. Um, so. Uh, but the answer, more specifically, is Alex Pina. He has the same deal. And what will he, what will he do? Uh, what, watch, watch that space. Oh, so um, can I read out the next um, yeah. question, Marta? Yes, do you, think a, yeah. do you think a more crude production like Patria could be popular with US audiences? So I think by crude, you mean violent? Um, I haven't, I confess, I have not seen Patria. Patria is based on a famous novel. It's to do with the Basque country, the troubles in the Basque country. I think maybe the local specificity might make it difficult. <coughs> Conversely, why do people go to foreign restaurants? Um, um, because do they want to eat hamburgers? No, they want a short holiday in a foreign country. So mainly, certainly if you're watching in the original version in the original language, you want something different. It has to provide you with something that American TV is not giving you. So to a certain extent, and this is what I've been arguing, the competitive advantage of Spain is Spanishness. So how do you define that? Because Patria would be very Basque to anyone living in Spain. Uh, to uh, uh, Farina is very Gallego to anyone living in Spain. To an American, it's all Spanish, basically. Um, but they may appreciate that particularity. I must say, when I watch, it, I'm not a specialist in this, but I'm watching a series of Italian police uh, dramas from Rai, which is the public broadcaster, the equivalent of Televisión Española. And they're all, for some reason, on um, Amazon. And each one is set in a different town. And I really love the locations. Um, uh, so I respond to that because, and I want to hear the, yeah, I, I, I kind of, I understand the language more or less, uh, but I love the particularity of the accent and, and the particularity of the location. Uh, so I would think that English speakers may be looking for that too, just to say when the pandemic permits, they will be going to Thai restaurants. Uh, as you hear in New York, we have a lot of the, uh, in this particular area, East European restaurants. You know. The Ukrainian national home, for example. I can't wait to go back to the Ukrainian national home. Now, this is actually food that, food that isn't so great, perhaps, but it's like having a little holiday in the Ukraine. Um, and that's what I go for, because it's not like my normal life in New York. And, and I think television works like that as well. It cannot be too, too difficult, uh, because then you're excluded. But it, cannot be too much the same. Uh, there's a delicate balance there as well. And, uh, so, so Yin, you are, you are welcome. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now Any other Mas, questions? Again, Mas. See? Have you, have you observed a pattern in the strategy they take to choose the English titles, you know, in relation to what you yeah. said about Money heist and how disappointing it was. And uh, yeah. and you, have you observed a pattern in the way they they uh, they um, distribute the series in English? Mm. No, I think it's uh, it's kind of consistently terrible. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only pattern. Well, actually, it's something like Las Chicas del Cable works very well as cable okay. girls, mm -hmm. and it's kind of it's almost funny as because it's like a commentary on on old TV and Netflix saying, you know. Um, and it's a show about technology in a way. But Money Heist, who thought of Money Heist? I mean, it's just so bland as a, mm. as, as a title. 
And, and I think there is, you know, this is why I think that they, that some people see Netflix as being the new ogre, uh, as being the agent of Americanization, but it's quite um, endearing, entrañable, to see them make these silly mistakes, which they, mm. they do kind of all the time. They make terrible shows. They make shows where they're clearly not aware of how this will offend people. They cannot translate a, a phrase like Mosquito Muerta. Mm. Um, and yet, say John Hopewell, who is a guy who writes for Variety, he's in quotes, just a journalist, you know, he can, I mean, he quotes this in his pieces. He cites particular Spanish idioms, Castilian idioms. And he says, this is part of the fun of the show for Spanish speaking audiences. Uh, and also who plays Tokyo? The actress who plays Tokyo is familiar to Spanish audiences from Physico Chimica. And so they've known her for 10 years. Um, and they've seen how she's grown up and there's a particular pleasure in that. There's a, almost a joke in the casting of Cable Girls. And there are three actors, including Blanca Suarez, were 10 years ago on a show called El Internado, mm. uh, the boarding school. So mm -hmm. there are, these are elements which foreign viewers will never get. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but they are added value to a local audience. Mm -hmm. uh, or to a specialist like me, because I think, oh my God, they're together again. And I'm very excited to see them. And everything that those actors do in their love triangle is underwritten to me by the show El Internado, a, a youth horror title. Um, mm. uh, and recently, uh, Netflix announced a new Spanish series. I forget what it's called, El, El Jaguar or something like this, some big cat. And um, it says, what does it say? It doesn't say Spanish series even. It says the new series from Blanca Suarez. Wow. Yeah. So I find this very interesting that we've gone back to Hollywood in the 1940s. Mm. It's like saying the new Betty Davis film, yeah. the new Joan Crawford. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, as I said briefly in the talk, if you look at a show like Alta Mar, with, it has quite specific reference to Veronica Lake's hairstyle and the character with the, with the curls which cover her, her eye. Um, they are giving audiences, female audiences, that Hollywood glamour, uh, which Americans gave Europeans in the 1940s. Mm -hmm. um, so I do not believe the thesis of uh, cultural imperialism, that the Americans control everything. Even on standard TV, broadcast TV, this has not been the case for 30 years. Some of you may remember Dallas was an American show. It was shown all over the world in prime time in the dub version. There is nothing like that now. Almost all countries have their own local production, which they love, and American production is exiled to uh, sort of minor, minor channels. The biggest, uh, the most watched Mexican telenovela last year was based on a Korean format. So where is the United States in here? It just doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. That the formats circulate globally and the United States is, is actually rather poor at doing that when they've adapted uh, uh, Spanish or Mexican formats, they've been disasters. Um, uh, so uh, the United States has become rather isolated in that way. And um, Netflix, Netflix 80%, I think still, 80% 80, 80 of the content on Netflix in Spain is English language, and only 20% is local. Mm. It does not help them because as I said before, mainly people want to watch local content that they want to see themselves reflected on mm. screen. Even if it's a women's prison drama. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I don't want to imagine myself in prison, but there, if I'm a Spanish audience, I'm responding to the, the heroes, the very particular linguistic elements in, in that show. Uh, and this is what people still watch TV for. So it's a great tribute to Spanish production that Americans, it would appear, really are watching American shows. But even when they might appear to be Americanized, it requires a certain leap of identification. Um, Thank you. Thank you so much. Any other, just one more last question. Yeah. 
Thank you so much, Paulie. Thank you very welcome. much. I'm particularly grateful to you for relating the reception here to the way in which the productions were inscribed in the local Spanish production in the tradition and history of Spanish TVs. And also mm -hmm. thank you for pointing out the relevant points to the Instituto Fernandez. That's, mm -hmm. that's been yeah. really uh, helpful and, and, um, mm -hmm. and everything's been really enlightening. Thank you so okay. much. Thank, thank you so much, much for the invitation. And have a have a good evening or night, everybody, where, yeah. wherever you are. Hopefully, we'll bring you here to, to Cambridge. In I would the love future. that. Okay. I would love that, and maybe I could talk about Mexico. Okay. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.